Bismillah rahman rahim Yesterday, we looked at how the youngsters, the youth of today, should listen and respect their parents. And I recited parts from the Holy Quran, the sayings of our Prophet, peace be upon him, and also our Imams. Salwat. I realize these lectures are in particular for the youth of today. This is why they're in English. And within the limited time, I've tried to come up with certain questions that would benefit them the most. So today's question I'm going to ask is, how do we choose a role model? How do we choose a role model? What does it mean by a role model? The definition of a role model is a person who serves as an example of values, attitudes, behavior, and associated with their role. For example, a father is a role model for his sons. Role models can also be person who distinguish between themselves in such a way that people admire them, people emulate them, people copy them. Who are the role models in today's society? That's a question to ask. When I often ask this question to the kids in school, believe you me, your father is not in the top 10 list, or your mother. It's amazing how the kind of names that crop up and you seem to think, what is the purpose of even having that role model? Examples, famous people, celebs, sports players, Singers, actors, dancers, uh, dancers and gangsters, if you hard to believe. Now, this is a very important issue because it concerns our own children. They are continuously being bombarded, brainwashed, if you like, through the channels of media. And I've always said that so many times. You don't realize this. For example, the films that you watch, the songs that you tend to hear, the video games that you're playing, the internet chats, the advertisements. I mean, think about it. Advertisements is a billion dollar industry. Even if it's for a couple of seconds, those images stay in your head. This is why when you go to a supermarket, you end up buying the things that you don't even really need because of the advertisement. These people are clever. This is why you're surrounded by these images and these sounds. And also the friends that you choose. It's amazing how when you look at some of the kids in school and the group of friends that they have, it's very, really important for you to choose the right friends. So, inshallah, with the limited time, I'm going to look at one particular angle towards how we should choose a good role model. Salwat. Can have another loud salwat, please? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says that when I created man, the human being, I first shaped him using mud and clay. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I blew my spirit into it. That without a doubt confirms that we have two parts. A physical body made from mud and clay, i.e. from earth, and also a metaphysical soul that is from God. Both parts together bring us into existence. If you are amongst those who chase the worldly treasures and forget your Lord, just like the non-believers who only recognize the physical body and its pleasures, why is it this the case? Because they cannot see the soul. The non-believers say, if asked what is a definition for a body without the reference to a soul because they do not recognize the soul they say a body is like a complex machine but if that was the case then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them an excellent reply he says in the holy Quran that where why don't you just like a machine fix it when it dies subhanallah if you think that the body is a machine, 
then it dies, why can't you fix it again? You can heal a body that is sick, but you can't bring back the body when it dies, you can't bring back the soul. Clearly there's a soul in the body. The question is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created both parts, He must also have created the nourishment needed to sustain both parts. Otherwise, both the body and the soul would wither and die. I would like you to just think about that for a second. Both body and soul are required. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created both of those parts. Therefore, it's his responsibility to nourish both parts. The body needs food and water and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables the earth to produce it, produce this. Otherwise the earth at the beginning of the creation, according to scientific theory, was inhospitable with high temperatures from volcanic heat and poisonous gases without any oxygen. So, what about the nourishment for the soul? This too can only come from God because it was his spirit and therefore remembering him feeds and enriches our soul. I'll take a quote from Dua Kumail. We say to our Lord, O oh, he whose name is a remedy, whose re remembrance is a cure, therefore remembering his name gives you that cure. Therefore find the role models that Allah subhanahu, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent himself. Whether you look at the 124,000 prophets or the imams, these are his chosen ones, not the ones that you need to go and choose. Because they are the ones that will guide you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to nourish that soul. Those who try to do it without him, they can have all the world's wealth and luxuries, but are often unhappy and sometimes even suicidal. Why is this? Because they overfeed the body and neglect the soul. So the soul starts to die. This is why so many teenagers of today are disappointed with their role models. You can imagine one poster goes up on the wall and then after a couple of months it's a letdown. So they take the poster down and stick somebody else's image on the wall. Choose your role model who strengthens your spirituality, not just the comforts of your body. That's the very reason why we remember Hussein al Salam. Salwat. He gave the biggest sacrifice ever. He had to do this to protect the Islam, to protect the Word of God, so that even over 1400 years, we could get that true message and therefore perfect our souls. Otherwise, we ourselves would have been totally lost without any purpose. This is why remembering these personalities in Karbala helps us to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because these models gave everything in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we should choose our role models very carefully. What benefit do they bring to you? A football player, an actor, does he actually take you towards your creator? No, he doesn't. So does Karbala provide you with the role models? Well, that will help you to inspire and improve the best version of yourself. These are the kind of characteristics that you need to be looking for in a role model. A role model that inspires you to be the best. Can we get that from the Karbala? Somebody that who would build your confidence. Somebody that will identify your bad habits or your negative aspects of your personality so that you are wish and forced to change to better yourself. Who would help to achieve you, achieve your characteristics to make you a better person. Who exhibits the same qualities that you wish to achieve. Show you a sense of purpose. These are the personalities that stood with Imam Hussein al-Islam against the tyrants of this world. So learn from each one of them in Karbala and who they were. Salwat. So tonight's personality in Karbala is a good role model. 
who definitely knew the difference between the life of the life and the life of hereafter, the difference between living here and the life of hereafter. That was Hazrat Qasim ibn Hassan al Islam. Salwat. During the 10th of Muharram, as the companions were being martyred one by one, a 13 year old Qasim comes towards Imam Hussein al Islam. He is the son of Hassan and the nephew of Imam Hussein. He comes to ask for permission. I ask you all, how many 13-year-olds would be eager to go to the battlefield? Hussein started to cry when he saw how very brave Qasim was and that he wanted to go because he loved his uncle Imam Hussein so much. When Imam asked him, how do you see death? Very famous lines. How do you see death? Qasim replied, death to me is sweeter than honey. Not because he didn't love the life Allah has given him, but because Allah had given him this task to support and defend his imam to fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qasim was looking at the life beyond this one. For a 13 year old to understand this concept, subhanAllah, that this life and the life in the hereafter are not the same. And if Allah has given me this gift of life, then what is better than to give it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By defending the grandson of the Prophet of Allah, his Imam. Imam said that he would face a lot of pain and hurt. I'll say that again because I'll make a reference towards the end. Imam said that he would face a lot of pain and hurt. And everyone around heard and had tears in their eyes. But Qasim stood tall, in spite not having food or water for three days. He had a smile on his face. When the tenth day came, and Hussein's companions were going out one by one to fight, Qasim kept coming and asking him for permission to go out to battle. But the Imam Hussein did not give him permission. <clears throat> but Qasim was determined to help his uncle and defend the religion of Islam. So when he came again, Hussein hugged him tightly and started to remember his brother Imam Hassan al-Islam. Oh Hassan, my dear brother, I miss you so much. And how can I let your Qasim go towards death? Qasim, you are my brother's son. I have promised my brother to look after you. My darling Qasim, you are the image of my brother. You remind me of Hassan. No, Qasim, no, I cannot allow you to die. Narrators say that at that moment, when Qasim went back to his mother, Bibi Umek Farwa, she gave him a letter to go and give to Imam Hussein al-Islam. When Hussein read this letter, it was from his brother Hassan al-Islam saying, Brother Hussein, a day will come when Islam will need to be saved by a sacrifice. Hussein, I will not be alive on that day. However, my son, Qasim will be there. It is my wish that Qasim al-Islam should represent me on that day. Imam Hussein was in tears when he read the letter. He embraces Qasim. They say that both cried so deeply that they fell to the ground. Later, Hussein started to prepare Qasim al-Islam Remember that he was only a 13 year old boy. His father's armor was far too big for him and his sword was dragging on the ground. He eventually with some help got onto the horse. It was difficult for Imam Hussein to see Qasim ride off. So Qasim did so very quickly when he got to the other side, where the soldiers were ready to move, Qasim started to address them. I am Qasim ibn Hassan ibn Ali. He reminded them how lost they had become because they were fighting with the grandson of the Prophet of Allah. Now despite his small age and size, he stood tall because of his bravery and courage. He made these men think twice before approaching him. As the events folded, they said, Qasim killed 
so many one on one. That's when they decided to all come at once from all directions. It was at this moment that he was struck on the head and fell to the ground. As he fell, he cried out for Imam Hussein. Hussein knew that his brother Hassan's memory is no more. Narrators say that as Imam Hussein rode out quickly towards Qasim, and in that moment the army saw that he was coming like a thunder, they all became frightened and panicked, and as a result they started to ride in all directions. By doing this, they ended up trampling on Qasim's body several times. The sharp hooves of the horses had cut up Qasim's body to a degree that when Imam Hussein reached him, he had already been martyred, and it was so difficult for Imam Hussein to recognize the body. They say that both Imam Hussein's body and Hazrat Qasim's body were cut into pieces due to the hooves of the horses trampling on them. But brothers and sisters, the difference is that Imam Hussein's body was trampled after he died. But Qasim's body got trampled while he was still alive. Can you now understand when Imam said that Qasim would face a lot of pain and hurt? As the horse's hooves paced into his body, and bit by bit, Qasim was being and sh shredded into pieces. Allahu Akbar. How did Muslim Imam Hussein find the strength to pick up Qasim's fingers, hands, legs, feet? Imam picks up Qasim's body parts and places them in his cloak. He then takes them back to the tent. He knew that his mother Bibi Umay Farwa would find it so difficult to bear. So how does he find the words to tell her that you will not be able to recognize your son? Imam doesn't come to the tent straight away. He waits outside. Bibi Zainab says, Brother, you rode out so fast towards Qasim's body, and yet you have taken such a long time to come back. Imam say, stays quiet, only he knew how difficult it was to pick up every piece of Hazrat Qasim's body. Zainab further asks, why are your hands empty? Where is Qasim's body? Imam replies, do you see the sack that is over my shoulder? Qasim is in there. When Zainab al looks into the sack, she is taken back at what she sees. Before she can say a word, Imam says, don't say anything out loud since Qasim's mother, Umay Farwa, is just behind you. Bibi Umay Farwa comes forward and asks, Imam, please let me see my 13-year-old son's body. When she opens up the sack and looks inside, she shouts out to all the women around her, Bibi Zainab, Bibi Kalsum, Bibi Rubab, Lela, Sakina, come and give me Mubarak because my sacrifice was the greatest. <laughs>